Good evening on this Wednesday, the 21st of December. It looks as though we will have two tropical cyclones near Australia within the next 48 hours, so let's get right on into it. In the latest update, the Bureau of Meteorology has initialized two tropical lows, one located in the Coral Sea and the other just toward the north near Darwin. As a result, Brisbane has issued a gale warning for portions of the Coral Sea as that system is forecast to strengthen from 30 knots to 40 knots and it will more than likely attain cyclone status within the next 12 hours. But more importantly for interest on land is what is occurring just to the north near Darwin. This particular tropical low is forecast to become a Category 1 cyclone by 4 p.m. on the 23rd of December. And look at the forward motion. It looks as though the system is going to be nearly stationary for the next several days. And cyclone watches are in effect for much of the coastline along the Northern Territory. The watch means that gale force winds could be felt along the coast as early as within the next 24 to 48 hours. And here is a more detailed look at the forecast track. As we see, within 48 hours, the storm is forecast to become a Category 1. But also notice that the forecast accuracy slowly diminishes with time, and it goes up to 350 kilometers within just two days. And the last Bureau of Meteorology update stems from the western region. As of this time, they are monitoring two separate areas. One is located well out into the Indian Ocean near 7 degrees south and 92 degrees east. But frankly, I don't see that this one is going to strengthen all that much. And the chances of it directly impacting the western Australian coastline is even less. More importantly, as we look at the highlighted text, they are closely monitoring the situation near the top end. They do think this will develop. And as it looks right now, it is unlikely that this system will directly impact much of the western Australian coast in the short term, but they are still not ruling out the possibility of a more westerly track as we head closer to next weekend. Meanwhile, the U.S. Joint Typhoon Warning Center is now on board with the idea that the Coral Sea Low will form, and a tropical cyclone formation alert has been issued. Furthermore, the 24-hour outlook has upgraded the chances of development near the top end to low. Here is the latest look at the 72-hour precipitable water animation, and toward the end of the frame you see that the Coral Sea system is continuing to organize, and one thing that we are seeing compared to yesterday is a lot more in the way of cyclonic vorticity near Darwin. So let's take a more in-depth look at both of these systems. Starting off with the Coral Sea low, this is the latest microwave satellite pass taken within the past three hours. We still don't see the most well-defined of tropical systems, but the overall trend over the past 48 hours has been continued slow organization, and the system appears to be right on the edge of becoming a tropical cyclone, and it more than likely will attain cyclone status within the next 12 to 24 hours based on this look. The latest visible and standard infrared animation of this system continues to show more convection and rainfall headed for New Caledonia. Again, the main threat will continue to be the risk of some isolated heavy showers that pass over New Caledonia, and it looks like the center is going to pass just to the west of the island, but some of the wind shear associated with the mid to upper levels is going to help push some of that thunderstorm activity more toward the east over some of the terrain. The latest water vapor shows the troughiness continuing to be active to the south of 20 degrees south latitude, so the system only has roughly 24 to 36 additional hours to be considered fully tropical, and once it gets below that latitude, it will begin to encounter much cooler water temperatures, higher wind shear, and the only chance of this low maintaining some degree of intensity is if it becomes more non-tropical in nature. But there's really no worries there because we are fairly used to seeing systems of that magnitude below this latitude. The following is the latest radar animation out of New Caledonia. And as of right now, it looks like the heaviest precip is located just to the north of the island. But weather conditions are likely to begin deteriorating fairly soon. And an active weather pattern will be likely over the next 48 hours. On the flip side, it still looks as though impacts along the Queensland coast will be fairly minimal. However, interests and vacationers along the coast are advised to still be careful as they venture into the open waters, as there is still the chance that high waves and winds will be present as we head into the holiday weekend. Now as we switch gears and switch our focus to the tropical low north of Darwin, this was the most recent microwave satellite pass, and the good news is that there is really no sign of an organized surface circulation just yet. But as we look at the latest visible satellite animation, it is becoming rather apparent that we are seeing an increase in cyclonic rotation just to the north of the coastline. And although the convection really isn't all that significant just yet, the more that we begin to see surface pressure falls, the more frequent the convective burst will become. 
The latest trend visible on the water vapor animation also seems to suggest that the upper level winds are beginning to relax, which is a signal that the wind shear values are becoming more favorable for development. And one very obvious indicator of that is the increasingly healthy signature of the outflow, especially the equatorward outflow channel. So this environment is steadily becoming more favorable for cyclone organization. The latest wind shear products from the University of Wisconsin appears to support this consensus. We see that the upper level ridge that was once located over some of the more interior portions of Australia is lifting northward into the Arafura Sea, which is supportive of cyclone formation and the wind shear values are dropping below 10 knots, which is extremely favorable, and the latest low-level vorticity analysis confirms that the vorticity max associated with this disturbance is on the increase, so it's more than likely just a matter of time until we begin to see a more well-defined surface circulation, and we will more than likely begin to see that within the next 24 to 36 hours. Additionally, the sea surface temperatures in the Arafura Sea and Timor Sea are much more favorable, with temperatures exceeding 28 to 30 degrees Celsius compared to what we saw with the initial tropical disturbance in the Coral Sea which is moving into sub 26 degrees Celsius water temperatures. In terms of the overall steering factors that will dictate the track of the Darwin tropical low, we have a mid-level area of ridging centered over western Australia and this ridge is going to have the tendency to want to push our tropical low more toward the west or eventually toward the south as that ridge begins to weaken but as of right now, this tropical low is fairly weak, so this mid-level ridge isn't really the primary steering factor at this time. In fact, really no parameter is, due to the fact that the steering currents are relatively weak, hence the reason why the Bureau of Meteorology is not forecasting much in the way of any significant change in the track or movement of the storm over the next 48 to 72 hours, but that ridge over Western Australia is going to be the main dictator in the overall track in the medium range. So with that said, let's go ahead and take a look at the latest dynamical model forecast and perhaps the one model that is looked at the most by the general public is the GFS forecast model. And as I set this into motion, I want you to notice two things. First off, the Darwin low does steadily intensify just to the north of the coast. And second, the overall motion of the storm is going to be relatively weak as it really doesn't move at all over the next six days. But then it eventually does begin to push more toward the east closer to the Gulf of Carpentaria and then back over the Cape York Peninsula. The primary reason behind the more easterly track in the medium range by this model is that the model is seeing the ridge over western Australia beginning to break down rather significantly while a trough makes a return to much of the Queensland coast which would have the tendency to drag that system more toward the southeast. As a result, the latest accumulated precipitation forecast for the next five days is actually showing less in the way of precipitation for much of the Northern Territory as it has the cyclone remaining just toward the north of the coast and then shifting a little bit more toward the east back over the Gulf region. But this precipitation forecast is highly dictated by whether or not the GFS has accurately forecast the track of the storm. Naturally, if the storm begins to move more toward the southwest, and this overall precipitation forecast is going to be completely wrong. Furthermore, the GFS is the only model showing a switch in the track more toward the east in such a short period of time, as you will soon see. This is now the latest 0Z run of the ECMWF model, and as we go into 24, 48, and 72 hours, the Darwin low is still not quite developed, but as we go into day 4, and especially day 5, it is quite apparent that the ridging over western Australia must still be intact, thus the reason why the storm is moving a little bit more toward the west. And as we go into day six, as it moves more into the open waters of the Timor Sea, it will have more room to develop, and that is the reason why the European is showing steady intensification by this point. And as we go into day seven and day eight, the storm is finally making a turn back toward the southeast. So this would suggest a rather significant cyclone impact for much of the top end of Australia. And as we go into day 9 and day 10, we know that the forecasts this far out are usually generally inaccurate, but the model does have the system moving back into the Gulf. And just to confirm the reasoning behind the ECMWF track forecast, we're also going to take a look at the model's mid-level forecast to confirm the overall steering parameters. If you recall, we looked at the current steering layer just a few moments ago, and we noticed that there was a fairly strong ridge over Western Australia. Here it is showing up on the ECMWF map. And notice as we go into day one, two, three, four, and even day five, that ridge is really not forecast to weaken all that much. 
Therefore, if anything, our tropical low or developing cyclone is going to have the tendency to want to drift ever so gradually more toward the west. And as we go into day six and day seven, that is when the ridge finally begins to break down. Thus, we do begin to see more of a southerly turn in the track of the cyclone. So it is now quite apparent that the GFS and ECMWF are showing two completely different track forecasts with regard to that Darwin low. So let's now go ahead and take a look at the ECMWF ensemble member forecast. And as we go into day one, two, and three, there's a development near Darwin. And then by day four and day five, it looks as though the ensemble members are suggesting that the more west-southwest track, at least within the next three to five days, and then eventually into day six, is a bit more likely. We are also going to quickly take a look at the Canadian, UK Met, and No Gaps models, and it must be reminded that these models are not the most accurate, but they do support the ECMWF solution of a more west-southwesterly track. This is now the latest Canadian CMC forecast, and it's quite apparent that the storm is forecast to move into the Timor Sea before making a turn toward the southeast. And we see the same general scenario being outlined by the latest No Gaps model forecast. And last but not least, this is the latest sea level pressure forecast from the UK MET model for day 5. And we see that the low is forecast to be centered near the Timor Sea and just off the Kimberley coast. So the bottom line as of right now is that all interest from the Kimberley coast eastward all the way through the Cape York Peninsula should be keeping an eye on this developing tropical cyclone. And the threat of heavy rainfall still definitely exists for portions of the Northern Territory in and surrounding the city of Darwin. So I just don't want anyone to be misled by that GFS forecast. Hopefully it verifies for the sake of interest in the Northern Territory. We definitely don't want any flooding, but at the same time that GFS forecast can easily be inaccurate and the model's consensus actually does support a more southwesterly track at this time. Also keep in mind that if the center does stay offshore, for the next several days, we will have to keep an eye on the possibility of the system becoming a little bit stronger than forecast. The wind shear values are generally light, and the sea surface temperatures are extremely warm. So that is another thing that we are going to have to keep a very close watch on. And before I close out this video update, I just want to reiterate that we're still keeping a very close eye on what is occurring in the northern Indian Ocean. As of right now, there's really nothing more than just a lot of disorganized convection, but some of the models continue to insist that at least an area of low pressure will begin to form and head a little bit closer to Sri Lanka in the day six time frame. As of right now, the latest ECMWF forecast for day six is showing nothing more than a pretty decent rainmaker spreading its way into Sri Lanka and the Southeast India region. But some of the other notable models, such as the GFS, Canadian, and No Gaps, are suggesting the possibility of a weak tropical cyclone formation as we get into the day six time period. So that is still definitely something to keep an eye on. Of course, it wasn't too long ago, probably within the past month, that we had a tropical cyclone pass through Sri Lanka with little to no warning from their government. And unfortunately, people did lose their lives. So this is something that we definitely have to watch as well. So thanks again for tuning in. For more video updates, please visit 28storms.com slash cyclone. And please spread that link to others that you feel may be interested in more detailed cyclone updates than what you may see from, say, a TV news or weather source. So go ahead and check that out. And we are going to attempt to steadily increase the amount of content regarding both of these upcoming tropical cyclones on the webpage so that you don't really have to go anywhere else to receive all the needed cyclone information that you are looking for. And that is all for now. So we will have another video update by this time tomorrow evening.